let's read the word. Please stand and let's read Acts chapter 2, 42 to 47. <clears throat> They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. That is the word of the Lord. Amen? Amen. It's been said that there's no such thing as a perfect church, but if you find one, don't join it because you will ruin it. But the closest Christianity ever got to a perfect church was when the first one gathered. It started after 120 believers waited in a room for the Holy Spirit 50 days after Jesus left this earth to go to heaven. The Holy Spirit fell on those believers and then Peter preached such a powerful sermon that 3,000 people trusted Christ, repented, and got baptized. This was the beginning of the church. What Theologian Wayne Grudem calls the community of all true believers for all time, and it was perfect. Now, of course, there were sinners in that church, but just the way it functioned, at least on this one occasion, I don't know if they're describing a couple of weeks or one day, but at this one occasion, it was fitting together perfectly. There are no divisions, dissensions, discords, or denominations. There's no alliterations, no arguing about the color of the carpet or complaining that the sermon went on too long. It was the model for all Christians to follow. It was God's ideal. Church comes from a word that literally means called out ones. That is people who are called out from the world and to God. Every one of us who is a born-again believer, we've been called out of the world and the world system into Christ's world. And when you're called into Christ's world, our thinking changes, our behavior changes, our style of living changes, and we let go of those old things for the rest of our life, don't we? For the rest of our life. The church is made up of all the people who are truly saved, all those whom Jesus died to save, and all those who have trusted in his death as payment for their sins. In other words, the church is the people. We are the church. Didn't we just sing that? We are the church, right? We, can you say that? We are the church. Are I am the church. I am. I am the church. What did this first church look like? What was the character of this early fellowship? What did they do? And how does our church, Community Church of the Hills, compare with those early days? And is there any room for improvement? Verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. They weren't distracted by other things. Those 3,120 people showed the genuineness of their faith by continually devoting themselves, continuing steadfastly by staying in fellowship. I, I love coming to church. I've said this once. I'm going to say it again and again. I love coming to church. Ever since I was a born-again believer, a brand-new believer, I had to go to church. I went as often as I could. And even on vacation... I would find a church to go to. What a great experience it is to go see how others worship. Now, I look it up online. I want to make sure that they align to my values. But I can't tell you the last time I missed church. Maybe in my entire 30 years, maybe, maybe five times, maybe. But I love church, and I love people who love to go to church. There's the same faithful people who come here week after week after week, and I count on you. If you're not in the parking lot, first people I look for is Mary and Leslie. And they were late today by five minutes. They're normally here at 10.10, 10, and they were here at 10.15. I go, uh-oh, uh-oh, but they showed up. 
right? And so I look out there longingly in the parking lot. Oh, Lord, fill the parking lot up. Please bring them here. Because the word of God is taught. Because we worship the wonderful Lord with worship. We pray. The Sunday school is so awesome. I can never just seem to get over there to, 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 to listen. I'm always doing these other things beforehand. But it's so much. The kids are excited. They're running around. Can you imagine when we have 100 kids running around like this? Wouldn't that be great? And then we'll have the parents with sticks ministry. <laughs> they weren't distracted by other things. Those 30,120 people showed the genuineness of their faith by continually devoting themselves, continuing steadfastly by staying in fellowship. The church had no website, no strategy, no marketing plan, no Facebook presence, nor Twitter feed. They got saved and proved their salvation by being baptized. Verse 41, those who accepted his message were baptized. That's the verse before. Have you been water baptized yet by full immersion? The time is now. Well, next week, because we don't have the baptismal. But if you haven't, there's no time like the present. The faith they professed is the faith they possessed. The church is made up of believers only, but unbelievers were certainly welcome. Just like unbelievers are certainly welcome here. They will hear the gospel preached, the teaching of God's word. They'll experience worship of Jesus as well as the love and sharing with one another. But an unbeliever should eventually feel uncomfortable with their spiritual condition after a while and will either commit their lives to the Lord or they will leave the church. There's just no way that you can sit in that in-between position. And we don't tell anyone to leave because of that, but just genuinely the preaching of the word will either cause someone to have their hearts changed or they'll leave. Verse 42a, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Are we devoted to the same things as the early church? God has designed the church to be a place where his word is proclaimed and explained. Do you hunger to hear what God will say to you on Sundays? And not only Sundays, but other days. My responsibility is to teach the word. And the way I teach is called expositional or expository preaching. The word exposition is related to the word expose. And I'm called to expose the meaning and intent of the biblical text, verse by verse, giving the context and historical setting, even studying the grammar, so that you will understand the author's intent. This isn't my opinion that matters. It's what did the author of the book, of the scripture, intend? What did God intend? I've been greatly influenced by these words from Pastor Tim Challies, and it really motivates how I preach. He wrote this, Give the congregation lots of Bible in your worship services. From beginning to end, from call to worship to benediction, soak your people in the word. Open with scripture. Read scripture. Confess sin through scripture. Provide assurance of pardon through scripture. Pray scripture. Preach scripture. Sing scripture. And send people on their way with scripture. Then as you converse with people after the service and through the week, continue to give them scripture and encourage, and that encourages and equips them. Be a minister of the word. That is my sole purpose. That and praying and pastoring. But the main goal is that we are a word-centered church. In the Bible studies, it's word-centered. Tom does extensive studies for the Sunday school. I, on the women's Bible studies, it's word-centered. On Nehemiah, the kids, they get the word. Our, our worship is the word. Our Wednesday night, we discuss the word. That is what we are, is we are a word-centered church. The questions you should ask yourselves after a service is this. Will I obey the word of God? Or how must my thinking be aligned by the word? Or how will I change my behavior to be fully obedient to the word? When you ask those questions, this reveals a submission to the authority of God and reverence for the Bible as his word. You got that? It reveals submission and it reveals reverence to the Lord. Because this is how he speaks. He speaks through his word. 
2 Timothy 4, 3 says, For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine instead to suit their own desires. They will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. We know that, don't we? All you have to do is turn on the television to watch any one of those preachers telling you what you want to hear. I tell you what you don't want to hear. And you still come back. Praise God for that. Those notes in your bulletin are to help you remember what I say and what God has said. We use PowerPoint so that you will remember. I tell stories to help you remember. We have Wednesday night service to help you remember and apply what you hear. Oh my gosh, it's doing it again. Um, Molly, I'm going to need you to... This is not working anymore, is it? Look at that. That is very frustrating. Man, I was on a roll, too. Okay, I don't know what's going on. I'm centered at home with the Morlinos. <laughs> we'll go from there. Good thing I have this backup, isn't it? Let's see where I'm at. Thank God. Hmm? Page five, thank you. The notes in your bulletin, all that we have here is to help you remember. Pastor Steve Lawson, he's a preacher who I greatly admire. He said this, doing God's word God's way requires an unwavering commitment to the primacy of biblical preaching and teaching. The early church experienced spiritual vitality not because of gimmicky techniques, but because it focused on the priority of biblical teaching. Sound doctrine enriched every aspect of this church's life. Does that make sense? Sound doctrine is what's more important than anything else, even more important than a, than a podium that doesn't go up very easily, more important than a computer that doesn't work. D. Martin Lloyd-Jones, he's another famous preacher from the past, said the primary task of the church and of the Christian minister is the preaching of the word of God. That's my primary task. What do you think would happen if the American church devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching? The American church... We would have a church that is once again powerful, not marginalized, not compromised with every wind of false doctrine, crazy teaching, and social movement. We would be steadfast, wouldn't we, if the American church did that. Unfortunately, we are so fragmented now. We would be zealous for the truth of the gospel and the exaltation of Christ's name. We wouldn't know who the Lord was. That's why we sang that song Right? We are the church set us on fire so that we can make a difference in this world. R.C. Sproul says, Here then is the real problem of our negligence. We fail in our duty to study God's word, not so much because it is difficult to understand, not so much because it is dull and boring, but because it is work. Our problem is not a lack of intelligence or a lack of passion. Our problem is that we are lazy. Who? Are you devoted to the apostles' teaching? If so, don't just save up your study time for this day. Be diligent readers and studiers of God's word. 42B, they devoted themselves to fellowship. Fellowship is not necessarily about eating at a restaurant together or going to the movies together. Fellowship is not two fellows on a ship. Pastor Dave Guzik says, the ancient Greek word koinonia, translated here as fellowship, has the idea of association, communion, fellowship, and participation. It means to share in something. The Christian life is meant to be full of fellowship, of sharing with one another. We share the same Lord Jesus. We share the same guide for life, the Bible. We share the same love for God. We share the same desire to worship him. We share our same struggles. We share the same victories. We share the same job of living for him. We share the same joy of communicating the gospel. We share all of this stuff. I went back to my church's 50th anniversary two weeks ago while I was on vacation. And we had a celebration night of 50 years of worship. And these were songs that I sang from the early 90s. And I looked across the sanctuary and I saw a man named Tui Latuli. 
and he was a beloved worship leader at our church. But the week before, he had a bandsaw accident and cut off his middle finger and the tips of two others. And I saw him over there clapping like this to the worship, softly. And I thought, I know that he desires to be up there worshiping. But he says to me, he says, you know, I've always wanted to learn the pedal steel guitar. He had an, he had an absolutely great attitude. Uh, one of the men's Bible studies whom I went to, his name is Brian. He was my chiropractor at one point and my daughter's. He's in an unjust lawsuit with the government that's taken away almost all of his business. And he had to put his home up for sale, which is a beautiful home by the beach where his family and, and they've had growth groups there. He's done so much. Well, his family, his daughter and uh, son-in-law said, no, don't sell the home. We'll sell our home, our beachside home, and we'll move in with you. And that's what they did. These are little encapsulated stories of the family. My friend Mike Fay, one of our founding elders of that church, I saw him at the church picnic, and I go, Mike, how are you doing? I hadn't seen him in 10 years. I go, how's Cheryl, his wife? And he goes, you haven't heard? She passed away nine months ago. He said this to me. He says, if I was to wish the worst curse on my enemy, it would be to take away his wife of 49 years. And here he is at the picnic. Here he is. Here they all are with their tragedies. And on Sunday morning at worship, I looked across an angel, another friend of mine. His wife passed away suddenly in the middle of the night four months ago, and he has now seven kids to, to, to raise. And he's in the front row worshiping with all of his kids. And lastly, my pastor's wife, who is, who is Beverly on steroids, if you can imagine. <laughs> Beverly's already on steroids, but imagine. Her name is Julie She's there at every service. She's, I mean, she's there at service and she serves, serves. She wasn't there. Why? Because she's battling cancer and it's gone to her throat now. So she can't talk. Why am I telling you this? Because these are people that I've grown up with for, for the 23 years I was at that fellowship. And these are people whose lives I am intimately and was, in, I was intimately involved in. And so I haven't seen them for a while. And look what's happened. There's tragedies, but there's also joys of new married couples and new babies as well. But there's this fellowship. And when we were at the church picnic, I looked at all the houses that ring the park. I thought every one of those homes have the same tragedies and the same joys, but they don't have this family to share. I know of every family's story in this congregation. I know your joys. I know your tragedies, and I'm so thankful, and you know mine, and what I've gone through, and we're all still here together, and we share each other's lives, and we do life together. The other day, as I'm thinking about the message in bed in my quiet time, I started just spontaneously praying for everyone in our congregation, and I, I, I know your stories. You all don't know each other's stories, but I, as the pastor, that's my responsibility. And I didn't want to share any of your stories here. But I love you. And I am so thankful to be a part of this family. So when Beverly shares the joy of Casey and her new children's book, right? And we have Janice, who's on passion, passionate to get these. She says our church gave more boxes than the other churches. Um, um, measuring person by person. And we went to an association meeting, our church association meeting, David and Tom and Casey and I last week, and every one of those churches suffered loss over COVID. They all got cut drastically. And after five years of complaining there, saying, oh, what's going to do? How is our church going to grow? Oh, our church is the only church in that whole association that's growing during COVID. It's a God miracle. It's a God miracle. And they're all doing life together too. I don't know why God chose us. It's 2% of the churches in America grew during COVID. We were one of the blessed ones. Now we want to keep them all in here. Some of those people have, have, don't come here anymore. But man, they're missing out. Would you agree? I think we really are a special congregation. We are a special congregation. 
Hebrews 10 says, And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. If there's people in here that you see aren't here, or there may be every other week uh, attendees twice a month, they're missing out on those other two weeks. Say, come on. Now, I understand there's times we go out of town and there's, there's events. I understand that. But man, watch it online at least. At least you get the teaching, but you don't get the fellowship, right? We are to take an interest in one another, to carry one another's burdens, to do all the one another's to one another. Hey, we will be together for eternity, so let's continue loving each other, shall we? The church is never just me and Jesus. It's we and Jesus. We are all together in this. It's about us living life together in this fellowship centered around Jesus. Are you devoted to the fellowship? 42C, they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread. Jesus commanded that we take communion together to remember him. The Lord's table is not optional. When we meet for the Lord's Supper, we meet together on common ground at the foot of the cross. When we take the bread and the juice, we remember Jesus' awesome work on our behalf by dying for us and giving us the hope of new life, of eternal life. We examine ourselves, confess our sins, thereby maintaining the purity of the church. That's why we do it frequently on the odd Sundays of the month. And I don't have a lot of rules here. Some families have chosen that their children who are not yet baptized, they don't take communion. I leave that up to the family. We, the elders, leave this up to the family. There are people who aren't believers who take communion and the word warns, shouldn't do that because it's taking it in a mocking manner. But I leave that up to you. I leave that up to you. I always say if you are a born again believer in Jesus Christ, you're welcome to take communion. But I leave that up to the individual. We leave that up to the individual. 42D, they devoted themselves to prayer. The early church took this to heart and never stopped praying for God to provide all of, the, all of their needs. This is why we pray to open the service and why I pray an extended pastoral prayer before the offering and communion. These words from Pastor Tony Merida greatly influence how I pray in our church. He wrote this, and I've taken this to heart. The pastoral prayer demonstrates that the Sunday service is not about entertaining or impressing people. Pray longer than what's standard in many churches, and people will see that your primary goal is not to satisfy a customer, but to seek and exalt the Savior. Hopefully they'll sense that something is different about your assembly. Good. Don't give the impression that prayer is of marginal importance or that it's something reserved for smooth transitions in the flow of worship. And I love this. Devote so much time to prayer in church that nominal Christians will grow bored talking to the God they only pretend to know. Casey prays that God opens our ears and hearts before the preaching. Afterward, I pray for him to preserve it in our hearts so that we may live it out. There's also an opportunity for you to be prayed for during the closing song when I will anoint you with oil according to the scriptures. Because we are devoted to prayer, we have a prayer chain. Because we are devoted to prayer, we pray at Sunday school, at the women's study, on Wednesday evening, we believe in prayer, and God answers prayer. Megan shared with me after Wednesday, and she said I could share this, is that we were talking about how has any prayers been answered, and, and God opened my trunk miraculously last week. Okay, that was, hey, it was amazing because it would, I couldn't turn the key and it's a car that you can't open from the inside and Michael Connor and Dave were coming over to help me with some work around the house and Michael's there and the first thing Michael did is he sat down on the hood, okay, because I had four bags of deer corn, I thought it was too much pressure, trunk, on the trunk. He sat down, that didn't work. Key wouldn't even turn. So then he and I go to the back seat and we try to pull down the back seat but it's such a cheap car, the back seats don't pull down. We were going to pull it down, and Michael, like, Michael was going to crawl in, I think. But as Michael was figuring out how to get in the back, I went around the, to the trunk again, and I said, Lord, in Jesus' name, open the trunk, and the key turned, and the trunk popped open. Oh, my gosh. And Michael said, Preacher, 
maybe you should start this with prayer next time. <laughs> so he's been disfellowshipped. <laughs> I shared that story, and Megan says, remember the tornado warning we got a few weeks back? Do you remember, did you get your tornado warning on your phone? Oh, it was on the night, it was on the night of um, Fields of Faith. And all the phones were going off, tornado, tornado. And all of us probably just turned off her phone or silenced them, right? Well, Megan, because they live in a fifth wheel, by choice, they're not homeless. <laughs> they're waiting for their home to be built later on. I want to clarify that so you don't get all these offerings. But <laughs> Tyler was packing up the bags, getting ready to go, and Megan said, let's just pray. And she got it on her heart. She said, she felt that God said, pray for the funnel to go back into the clouds. She goes, what? So she started praying. Okay, Lord, may that funnel cloud go back in, into the clouds, go back in the clouds. She didn't know why to pray that, but she did it. She prayed it obediently. And she heard later on in the news, the news came on and says, it's the strangest thing. The funnel was coming out of the cloud, but it went back in three times. Three times that thing came out and it went back in. Who knows that it was only Megan while the rest of us are shutting off our phones. She's praying. You know, prayer is so amazing because God is so amazing. That's why we pray. So they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. And what happens when a fellowship is devoted to these things? Verse 43. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. The word used for awe is phobos, referring to fear or holy terror when one gets a sense of God's presence. If we are wholly devoted, we might get a sense of that awe more often. The sense of awe they felt was also because of the miraculous signs the apostles were doing. Why don't we see so many miracles today? I don't know, maybe we don't have the, the sense of awe. Back then, to show that these teachers were from God, God authenticated their ministry with signs and wonders. He authenticated what the apostles were saying with those amazing things. But listen, Hebrews 2, 3, and 4 says, This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. You know, we don't need signs and wonders to prove that God is here. We have his word and the solid teaching, and we're free to do so. But we do pray for God to move when he needs to in a country or in our city or in a life, right? We're praying for unsaved loved ones or for those who are terminally ill. And sometimes we just got to suck it up and move forward, right, and trust God. Krista, I am so proud of Krista because I said, just come. Just come, and we're going to pray for you. You're not going to feel good. Since you're not going to feel good anyway, you might as well come to church and not feel good, right? So guess what? For the last three weeks, she said, she said this. Can I share that? She went to the doctor. So the doctor goes, you know, Krista, you're going to not feel good all the time. And she goes, Pastor Steve, that's what you told me. And she's coming anyway. I go, great, Krista. I don't let her off the hook. I go, great, now we'll see you on Wednesday nights. <laughs> but it's awesome. Krista says, what the heck? And she comes, and I'm always, we're always blessed to see you when you're here. We're blessed to see you when you're here. Does he still do miracles today? Of course. I think the biggest, the biggest miracles would be if we all read the Bible, shared our faith, made disciples, and all contributed to the life of the church. That would be the biggest miracle if everyone did this. And verse 45, they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Why did they do this? They loved Jesus and they loved each other. They didn't need a building campaign or earnest pastoral appeals from the pulpit, no building fund, anything. You know what? I have never had to make an appeal for funds since I've been here. I'm in my... Since I've been here since 2015. I have never made an appeal for funds. I've only taught on giving maybe four or five times just when it came up in the Bible. You know why? Because you're all so generous. You're all so generous. I don't need to. And I had a whole little teaching here on why you should give, but I don't need to because you know why? <laughs> you guys are already giving. Praise God. Are you a giver? 
Do you honor God by giving him back a portion of what he's given to you? Where's your heart? For where your treasure is, Jesus says, there your heart will be also. Verses 46 and 47, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. These folks went to church every day. Oh, I love that. Imagine the day when we're open seven days a week, right? And I'm here on Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday, and Tom's here on Friday and Saturday night teaching, and Monday night, that's my day off, so David will be here teaching, and the ladies will all have our studies, and every night, that's my goal, seven days a week church, imagine that, in Texas, in Texas, they couldn't get enough of it, every day, I believe in the original Greek text in this verse, there's an inference that they even arrived early, it's a joke, no one's laughing. <laughs> Thanks, Molly. <laughs> this was one happy, joyful church, and why shouldn't they be? They are thankful and appreciative of their God who saved them from hell and granted them mercy, not judgment, because of Jesus' death on a cross. And guess what happened? When the unbeliever saw this loving, gracious, thankful, joyous, giving fellowship, guess what happened? The most amazing thing ever? Verse 47b. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your worship. Thank you for your love of our Savior. Let's pray. Lord God, we are blessed and thankful that you have chosen us to be a part of your kingdom, your kingdom here on earth. And not only the kingdom here on earth, but the kingdom in heaven. But to be in church with your people is like heaven. Where can we go, Lord? Where else can we do this? The old TV show Cheers says you want to go somewhere, someplace where everyone knows your name, but that's a bar. There's no fellowship in a bar. There's no fellowship around Christ in a bar. There can be, but there usually isn't. But we have it here. And what a rich fellowship we have. Thank you for each and every person who is here today and those who will be here next week and those who are coming later. We are thankful for what you're doing here. Oh God, if only you would bring everyone here, Lord everyone who's not already in a church fellowship. If only you would bring them here to hear the teaching of your word, but even more importantly to me at least is the great fellowship and the love that everyone who comes feels from these people. Thank you because that's your love of God. That's their love of God and your love in their hearts by the Holy Spirit you have given them. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. Let us go forward this week in the joy of the Lord, trusting you for all the things that we can't solve ourselves. We thank you for answered prayer, for preventing the tornado, for bringing Krista here. Thank you for opening my trunk. <laughs> we love you, Lord. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.